You don't want somebody to go into the prison system and come out worse. Right. And which happens. Which happens, most right? Of the and time. then we hear about these horrific incidences. Parole board let him out. Two days later, he pushes somebody into the train tracks, right? This is, this is not what you want. How do you prevent these things from happening, right? By being proactive. By being responsive instead of being reactive. Don't wait for something to happen. That's Sheldon Johnson. You might recognize him from the news this week after he was arrested in connection with a foot, an arm, two legs, and a head, which were found in a freezer. What is that? That was Sheldon on Friday, almost exactly a month from when he appeared on JRE with civil rights lawyer Josh Dubin. There's a great book um, called In the Belly of the Beast about a guy that went to prison and then he goes out and he he murders um, someone. And he writes this book just explaining, I want you to understand what this did to me. I read it when I was in college. Um, and uh, I should read it again. I probably have a different perspective on it now. It might hit home even more, but... Yeah, bro, definitely read that book again. No, really. But if you're wondering what's going on here, let me explain. Josh Dubin's actually a great guy. He makes regular appearances on JRE with recently released and often wrongfully convicted felons who he's helped through the Innocence Project. Now, I'll talk more about his work and the big picture in a little bit, because as you can imagine, I really want to talk about Sheldon Johnson, who, like I said, appeared on JRE at the beginning of February. And unlike most of the guests that appear alongside Josh, Sheldon was actually guilty of the crimes he was convicted of. The thing is, though, he received a 50-year sentence, which doesn't really seem to fit the crimes he pleaded guilty to. Let's let him explain. I caught the gun charge that uh, that 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 triggered the felony that it allowed them to be able to sentence me the way that they did in 1994. Two people in particular I gave consignment to, and I ended up getting arrested for a case. And when I sent someone to go pick up the money from them, they kind of just was like, you know, eh, whatever. I'm not paying them. You got arrested for something. Mm -hmm. You're in jail. Yes. These guys figure since you're in jail, f it, we're not going to pay them. Yeah, I'm not going to pay And them. then the case that you were arrested for got dismissed. Got dismissed. Right, I got so acquitted. Then you, so then you come home. So then I come home and, you know, I need my money. You know, I gave you something, and we had an understanding that you were going to pay me. And when I came home, when I finally located this particular individual, he had his girlfriend with him. Um, and this guy owed me $5,000. And when I saw him, he had a bunch of jewelry on. He was with his girlfriend. She had a bunch of jewelry on. And I said, hey, man, where's my money at? Oh, yo, I was going to pay you. And I took his jewelry. And his girlfriend happened to be there and... um. Unfortunately, she got caught up in the situation. I had a bunch of young guys with me, and they robbed her as well. And he got hit in the head with the gun right here on the side of his head, and he got two stitches. And they gave me 25 years for that case. Did you hit him in the head? No. One of the guys that I was with hit him in the head. And he identified me in a photo array, unbeknownst to me. He identified me in a photo array. Um, this guy, you know, as far as I was concerned, he was in the streets just like I was. So right. in my mind at the time, this is a guy who I gave something to. He's living an illegal life. I'm living an illegal life. In right. hindsight, as I, as I moved on and I became more mature and I began to reevaluate myself, I realized how wrong that was. But that was later on. At this time, I committed the crime and I just kept moving. Another guy that I ran into, he also owed me some money. He owed me $7,000, and it kind of went along the same ways. I got word that this is where he was at, and he was selling drugs, and I was going to get my money. And the same circumstances kind of ensued. Saw so, him, um, hey, what's going on? Reading in between the lines and outside the margins without really going into all of the details, I robbed him because he owed me $7,000. Did he get physically hurt? No. He didn't get touched. Got roughed up a little bit, but... There was no physical, there was no physical harm, nothing. 
Okay, there's so much to unpack here. First of all, like I said, he admits that he committed these crimes, so it's not a matter of a wrongful conviction. The problem is I don't think he fully understood at the time, or even now, how many crimes he actually committed by robbing those two people. It sounds like some weapons charges, attempted murder, robbery with a weapon, etc, etc. So it sounds like he basically got all these different charges piled on him and received the maximum sentence for each one, and then the judge said he couldn't serve them or concurrently, they had to be served back to back. But if he paid close attention to the way he was talking and his tone, he clearly still feels that because he was playing by a different set of rules on the streets, he didn't really understand why those two guys would have cooperated with the police, which led to his convictions. I am in the process of going to court. I'm going back and forth to court. I'm on Rikers Island at the time. It's just crazy on Rikers Island. Um, that's when the gangs was involved. I was I was blood. I was a gang member. This is where the cut comes from on my face. I have a bunch of stab marks from just being in those environments and being on Rikers Island and just um, warring with other f uh, rival gangs. Uh, mostly Latin kings and Inyatas. And so he was mixed up with the wrong people. He was balls deep in the gangster life and he was staring down the barrel of a long prison sentence. My final offer before trial was 23 years, which kind of blew me away because my lawyer kept telling me that my maximum sentence was 25 years if I went to trial. So in my mind, I, it just didn't make no sense to me. Why would I forfeit my rights to an appeal if there's only a two-year difference? Um, I told the judge I would take 15 years right now. He refused to uh, accept my plea offer, and I went to trial, and then I ended up getting 50 years. So they give you 25 for each case? Is that 25 what it for each case. In the extended discussion, he mentioned that he had a black lawyer, a black judge, and a white prosecutor, which he believed could explain why he received such a long sentence. It was part of a discussion about how black cops who are in the minority in their precinct will often treat black people more harshly to avoid any accusations of favorable treatment. Now, it's not really something I want to get into right now, but I thought it was important to mention that for context. But in terms of his journey, all of this happened in the mid-90s, and he was finally convicted and sentenced in 1999, spending 25 years in prison. He was released last year in May after some procedural issues were uncovered by Josh and his people, meaning he wouldn't have to see out his 50-year sentence. So, as of almost a year ago, he was a free man. He became a youth worker with the Queen's Defenders and began to advocate for rehabilitation and criminal justice reform. And when I got out, I made a decision that I was going to walk away. And I didn't care about what the consequences was. And I said to myself, I've been doing bad for so long, I'm going to try to do something good. If all else fails, I could always go back to doing bad. But let me try. Let me give it a shot. Um, and I ended up getting into school program. I got my GED. Um, I left the gangs alone, which was a benefit for them because, you know, I was what you call an authoritarian. I was a rule guy. I'm, I'm still a rule guy. I like rules. Um, and it was to their advantage to get rid of me anyway. I got into school. I got my GED. Started interacting with guys who were teaching ART, aggression replacement training. And I started to begin to understand how these concepts work, what positive visualization is, um, deep breathing, how to remove yourself, conflict resolution, all of these ideas of, of change began to take place with me. Um. Man, it's so chilling listening to him say those things after his arrest yesterday. And I'll get to those details in a moment, but I just want to point something out that I found really interesting. These episodes of JRE, where Josh brings in one of his clients to tell their story, are really interesting, and I personally try to listen to as many as I can. The one thing that blows me away in these episodes is how much humility these guys have. I remember one guy in particular, Derek Hamilton, who spent 23 years in prison for a crime he never committed. He became a lawyer while in prison and helped out dozens of other inmates with their cases, as well as securing himself $7 million for a lawsuit he filed against three police officers for fabricating evidence against him. Gotta love qualified immunity, huh? Anyway, my point is, if you listen to enough of these podcasts, you develop a deep appreciation for just how humble these guys are in the face of the hardship they endured, all the years they lost, the humiliation, the ridicule, the list goes on. But with Sheldon Johnson, this was the first time I felt 
Like, this guy still had the wrong mindset. Granted, he was actually guilty of his crimes compared to the other guys. He still had a very strong victim mentality. Did you hear how he spoke about the gangs being lucky that he wanted out? Um, and it was to their advantage to get rid of me anyway. Plus, I knew a lot of the guys who were at the top. Why was it to their advantage to get rid of you? Because I was the type of person who would say, you doing that for what reason? Nah, you can't do that. The rule says that you can't do this, you can't do this. This is what the rules say. Yeah, you can tell he hasn't fully grasped why organized crime is so harmful. For him, it was more of an issue of those guys not following the rules, and even Rogan pulled him up and asked him for an explanation. Now, don't get me wrong, none of these things I'm talking about here are necessarily evidence of guilt or anything like that, but if any of you guys listening know people like that, you know, those guys who have unhealthy obsessions for arbitrary rules, you'll appreciate where I'm coming from. I once knew a guy who had this weird obsession with cutting birthday cakes in a certain way. Clearly, that's not normal, and, well, we don't talk about him anymore. I'll just leave it at that. And so just over four weeks after appearing on JRE, Sheldon Johnson has been charged with an absolutely gruesome crime. Now, it's very early on in the case, it only happened just this week, so more details will no doubt come to light, but police are alleging that Sheldon had some sort of beef with a guy he served time with, his name was Colin Small, and police said they found Small's remains while checking on him at the request of his Bronx apartment building superintendent. Apparently, some of the residents said they had heard two gunshots coming from within Small's apartment on Tuesday, as well as someone saying the words, please don't, I have a family. When police officers arrived to check on Small, Johnson was actually still there at the apartment and they detained him while they obtained a warrant to search the apartment. The officers found Small's torso and one of his feet in a large bin. Small's other foot and his arms, legs and head were found inside the apartment's freezer. Wow. Police are alleging that Johnson shot Small, then dismembered him, booking him into jail on Thursday on charges of murder, manslaughter, and criminal possession of a weapon. There's actually CCTV footage of Sheldon Johnson at Colin Small's apartment going in and out with cleaning supplies, and at one point, he wore a blonde wig to disguise his identity. Seriously, you cannot make this stuff up. But after I went back over the full episode from February today to refresh my memory, a couple of other things popped out for me. Listen to how Rogan describes the root cause of this issue. You know, one of the things that's happened through all of our conversations that we've had on the show is it, it highlights how insanely broken the criminal justice system is and how little oversight there is and how few people are looking at these individual cases and that you can have one judge who does what they did to you. No one's looking, no one cares, no one pays attention, and until someone like you goes in and starts combing over this and the root cause of it is never addressed. The root cause of, I mean, I've said it ad nauseum, but I'll say it again, where the f did we come up with a hundred and whatever billion dollars to send to Ukraine and we don't have any money? We have nothing? I mean, this is my, my take on this whole make America great again thing. You want to make America great again? Make it so there's less losers. Make it so that more people have a f***ing chance. I mean, I, we're looking at each other because we just had, we just like had lunch before we came. It's like the precise conversation that we had. Um, I told you this is a mother that gets it. Oh, I know. They clearly don't get it. I think it's easy to blame funding for these issues, and Rogan pulled the Ukrainian war as an example of wasting American taxpayer funds. There are obviously many more examples of wasted tax money, but I really don't think that will address the problem. Just the other day, I played a clip of Rogan complaining that money isn't the issue in fixing homelessness because all these organizations are winding up so much of this money into salaries and operating costs. There's really no cure for psychotic behavior. 
Sometimes you've just got to keep these guys off the streets, and that's where I think these types of conversations fall over. I should say that Josh Dubin did make it clear in this episode that Sheldon was guilty, and he wasn't trying to sugarcoat it, but I still feel like Rogan and Josh let Sheldon brush over the details of his earlier convictions and the circumstances surrounding them. At some point, both Josh and Rogan have to take some responsibility for the research that goes into these guests that they bring on before they sit around and sing Kumbaya together. What I hope to bring is, is these stories where you get to know the person. He's no, I, I, look, I'm deeply, deeply flawed. Sheldon will be the first to tell you, like, I did some up thing like you said at the outset of the episode let him hit the starting line well you know what you were saying earlier about building a sandcastle one grain of sand at a time from my perspective the feedback that i get it's these conversations we've had we've had quite a few of them now they they have changed a lot of people's ideas on how the prison prison system is structured what the problems with it are how many people are wrongfully incarcerated how incredible some of these people are, wasted potential, locked away forever for th something never did, and they didn't break. Instead, they got stronger and wiser and more intelligent and more educated and came out better. This yeah. is what you want, though, right? You don't want you don't want somebody to go into the prison system and come out worse. Right, and which happens. Which happens, most right? Of the time. And then we hear about these horrific incidences or people getting pushed onto the train tracks because you have a guy who has a mental illness and yeah. instead of getting the services that he needs, you put him in prison, parole board let him out, two days later he pushes somebody into the train tracks, right? This is this is not what you want. Yeah. So how, and, and how do you prevent these things from happening, right? By being proactive, by being responsive instead of being reactive. Don't wait for something to happen. So by that logic, Sheldon should never have been released from prison, am I right? Yeah, it's almost difficult to listen to that after what happened this week. And in a way, they're still kind of right. I mean, they're basically trying to bring awareness to the fact that prisons break people, and instead of trying to fix it after the fact, they need to make sure they prevent guys spending time in lockup when they don't belong there. But people weren't so forgiving in the comment section of the clip that Rogan posted to YouTube from that episode. Obviously, after the news came out and the media were reporting that Sheldon Johnson recently appeared on JRE, people piled into the comment section, and now all the top comments are taken up by people in disbelief at how this could have happened. The problem is, both Josh and Rogan didn't realize the problem they were trying to articulate was sitting right next to them in human form the whole time. Most of the time, these are the miracles that are coming out. Right. I mean, most of the time, you're right. The the cycle of from the street to prison back to the street to prison most of the time recidivism yeah the yeah, yeah I mean I I'm just saying it in plain English most of the time it's churning out um, monsters there's a great book um, called In the Belly of the Beast about a guy that went to prison um, and he describes what it did to him psychologically um, what it did to him. To, to every um, cell in his body. Um, and then he goes out and he, he murders um, someone. And he writes this book just explaining, I want you to understand what this did to me. I read it when I was in college. Um, and uh, I should read it again. I probably have a different perspective on it now. It might hit home even more. Yeah, I suspect it'll definitely hit home even more now. But let me finish by saying that I think what Josh is doing is absolutely necessary. He's not always going to get it right, just like the justice system doesn't. And for Rogan to dedicate so much of his time to giving these guys a voice is definitely a good thing overall. So even though I'm criticizing them for probably bringing on the wrong guy and not seeing the warning signs that he was unstable, it shouldn't really take away from what they're trying to do. And the sad thing is, all of Josh's good work on JRE and behind the scenes is going to be overshadowed by this now, which totally sucks, especially considering all the other lawyers and advocates behind the scenes who do a lot of the legwork to get these guys out of prison, they will now have to live with what Sheldon is alleged to have done, even though it was entirely unpredictable and psychotic. But anyway, I know a lot of you like my legal breakdowns, I got so many comments and emails from you asking me to cover this in the last 24 hours. So I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know what you think of the whole situation in the comments below. And if you haven't subscribed yet, consider jumping on board so you don't miss out on any of my uploads. That's it from me. Thanks for joining me. I'll catch you in the next one. 
you would think that someone who's in this position as a judge, he's an arbitrator, right? He is supposed to be someone who is in a position of power and authority. And I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe he saw something. I don't know what his experiences was. I, I, I can't speak to that. Um, you know, maybe he saw me as, as a menace, you know, um,